I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes meeting at uh, Packers East Restaurant at 2901 West Addison Street. I would like to specifically first go over the rules of conduct of the college. There are basically two rules, and I think we all know what they are. First is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Our format will consist of the following. We will have a brief announcements period, then our speaker will speak for a while, then we'll have a question and answer period. After that question and answer period, you'll have a chance to speak in a rebuttal session. The only thing I ask about rebuttals is that they be coaching the right. Tonight, we're going to have a speaker. He's going to honor the legacy of UGV Debs and the Railroad Workers Union. Mike Burroughs states, in recognition of Labor Day, this presentation will honor the legacy of UGV Debs and his evolution from organizing railroad workers in the mid-1890s to become one of the most prominent fighters for social justice in the first two decades of the 20th century. What timeless lessons can we learn and apply to our present struggles for social justice? Mark Burroughs is former co-chair of Railroad Workers United, RWU, and is a cross-craft inter-union caucus of rail labor activists across North America who strive for unity, democracy, solidarity within the rail unions in order to be more effectively fight for safety, dignity, and quality of life as part of the broader struggles for social, political, economic, and environmental justice. Prior to retiring last year, he worked in the rail industry for 40 years, predominantly as a locomotive engineer. He represented his union, local, United Transportation Union, number 1433, as their delegate to the last two international conventions. Let us give a round, rousing word, word of applause for our speaker tonight, Eugene V. Debs. My minor typo, uh, uh, I'm Mark Burroughs, I, I might want to be speaking about Eugene Debs. <laughs> yeah. I know that. Well, but that, thanks for that introduction. Hey, Eugene, all right. As I, uh, is this a proper I, mic? Yeah, it's, it's a good way to go. As I uh, pull myself together here, just real quickly, uh, uh, I want to add on to what people were saying about the uh, Labor Day event um, down in Pullman on Monday. Uh, my understanding is uh, uh, Tom Shepard is trying to uh, um, trying to start a, a petition or something to get a, a, a um, some kind of monument or some kind of recognition of Eugene Debs uh, down there. Uh, if, if nothing else, uh, a little equal, t a little equal time. Um, and I want to thank the uh, organizers of the uh, College of Complexes for inviting Railroad Workers United to speak tonight. Um, thanks for coming out on a Saturday night on a Labor Day weekend. Um, before I briefly introduce Railroad Workers United and who we are and what we're about. Um, I want to preemptively address what I consider to be a fair question. What is the relevance of an organization of rank-and-file railroad workers to the general public uh, not employed in the rail industry? And the short version of that answer, I think, can be summed up in, in two words. Uh, Lac Magentic, um, the name of that small Canadian town north of the border, has now become synonymous. With, with what many consider to be the worst case scenario of the potential consequences of railroads gone wild. And though the spectacle of a portion of the downtown burning to the ground and 47 people dying, many just being incinerated alive in the inferno, was horrifying, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, is that these incidents on the railroad have the potential to be much more devastating and uh, perhaps I'll have to be able to go into more depth than that. But suffice to say, for now, the short version, a similar incident uh, involving, uh, such as uh, Lac Magenti, uh, involving something like ammonia or chlorine in a dense 
heavily populated metropolitan area uh, would, would make Lac Magenta uh, be like a walk in the park in comparison. The, 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 casualty, the potential casualties could be astronomical. Um, uh, Lac Magenta was an awakening for anyone, a rude awakening for anyone living uh, or working or just hanging out anywhere close to uh, some railroad tracks. Conscious railroad workers have always known that the possibility of, of that kind of incident and, and, uh, and, and potentially much worse has always existed. And for many of us, it was our worst fears being realized. Given the abundance of hazardous commodities being transported on trains that are now getting to be two miles long plus uh, with overworked, fatigued crews, as they threaten to try to, 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 to run these trains engineer only, uh, more and more deferred maintenance of, of the infrastructure and rolling stock, uh, running these trains nonstop, 24-7 through city and countryside, I think it's fair to state that the general public has a life and death stake, literally, in railroad workers' fight for a safe work environment. If, if the general public didn't comprehend that concept before the tragedy of Lac Magenta, many do now in its aftermath. Um, on that note, I'd like to briefly introduce Railroad Workers United, uh, what we're about, uh, who we are, what we're about. The easiest, most efficient method will be to quote from our newsletter. We, uh, we publish a uh, quarterly newspaper. Um, I have a few left. On the second, at the bottom of the second page, I've little, you know, who we are. So I'm just going to quote from that for those of you who aren't familiar with this. Railroad Workers United was organized in April 2008 at a founding convention in Dearborn, Michigan. Railroad RWU grew out of decades of struggle within the craft unions for unity, solidarity, and democracy. We are carrying on a tradition of rank and file activity which dates back to the 1890s and the time of Eugene B. Debs. RWU is a cross-craft inter-union caucus of rail labor activists across North America. All rail workers of all crafts from all carriers who support our statement of principles are welcome to join in our efforts. Um, we, on our website, railroadworkersunited.org, we have a full page summarizing our statement of principles, but here in the newsletter we just have little bullet points. So uh, they can be summarized as unity of all rail crafts, an end to inter-union conflict, rank-and-file democracy, members membership participation and action, solidarity among all railroad railroaders, and no to concessionary bargaining. So that's a summary of who we are and what we're about. And, um, and I'm going to be representing our positions, and yet there's going to be times I'm going to be representing my own personal opinion, and I'll, I'll uh, try to qualify that. Uh, um, needless to say, if the established unions that exist today, if the established rail unions were conducting themselves as we feel they should be, if they were advocating and fighting for what we consider to be just, righteous, and legit demands um, for safety, dignity, and quality of life, there wouldn't be much need for our you, but uh, that, that's not the situation. So uh, I joined RWU back in 2011 when I became aware of their existence, and I, I felt that what they stood for and what they were doing in, in real-time action is what our established union should be doing. I saw them as a virtual prototype for railroad workers, and actually other unionists also. Uh, uh, but, but an example in the real-time present of what our unions can and need to look like in the future, uh, although it really needs to be yesterday, uh, the sooner the better. We hope that as we gain a larger following within the unions, to be able to challenge from within our respective unions to chart a course for effective resistance against today's robber rail barons and their cutthroat greed. We don't seek to replace the existing unions, but we fight for a long overdue transformation. That goes back to uh, Debs' fight to build the American Railway Union. 
With the Railway Labor Act making it virtually illegal to strike as a last resort, we know that we'll never uh, triumph over the bosses without the support of the general public. Um, and though our, our safety issues are serious and urgent, we are also citizens of the community. We, we not only have our own issues, as specific issues as railroad workers, but, but we're impacted by, by everything else going on in society, in the world we live in. We know we need to support others struggling for social justice. Uh, none of us can do this alone. So we know we need to be part of and do what we can to help build a broader movement as, as we fight the specific issues uh, that we have to deal with on our own uh, battlefront. I want to say a little bit about our basic slogan of uh, unity, solidarity, and democracy. I try not to be presumptuous, but if I were a betting man, I'd wager that the vast majority of you here tonight are less than satisfied and content with what's going on in the city, the state, the country, around the world. I don't think I'm going out on a limb with my personal opinion that a significant contributing factor as, as to why, how we've ended up um, uh, in the current state of affairs that we're in today. Um, uh, a significant contributing factor, in my personal opinion, uh, has been a lack of unity among those with common interests, um, uh, lack of human solidarity, and real democracy in the political process. So our struggle to chart an effective course within our unions in my opinion, can be seen as a microcosm of our struggles in society as a whole, uh, in, in our struggle for um, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a simple, def simple definition of, 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 of that, you know, can be summed up, you know, decent jobs at uh, uh, decent wages uh, so we can have decent, dignified living conditions. Um, safe working conditions, um, health care and education as a human right not dependent on one's disposable income, clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, foods that, that, that's not contaminated or poisoned. Uh, most of us would prefer a world that's not in a state of permanent perpetual war, not only for the domestic economic cost, the cost in the lives of our brothers and sisters uh, in uniform who live within our borders, but just as important is the slaughter of so many civilians, our brothers and sisters in the human family. Uh, that, that's just as much the tragedy of war, uh, in my opinion, as, as well as um, our own local casualties. Imagine if one of these uh, CNN or MSNBC polls would go around the country and just pose the question, if you had a choice, would you prefer a world that looks something like what I just described? Um, I believe the vast majority of responses would be, you know, hell yes. Yet we find ourselves, it, it seems like we find ourselves light years from that vision. Uh, so the struggle for unity, solidarity, and democracy is not only critical within our unions, uh, but within society as a whole. Yeah. It goes without saying that these are challenging times we are living in. Even before the horrifying nightmare tragedy in Southeast Texas began to play out live in real time before our very eyes this past week. Um, and on that, again, my own personal viewpoint, uh, many are legitimately questioning the impact of climate change, global warming, on the severity of, the, of, of storms like Harvey, Sandy in the Northeast a few years ago, and of course Hurricane Katrina, to name a few obvious storms, in addition to the current day-to-day -day and real-life manifestations of global warming and climate change around the world, that may not get the big headlines and lead story on the news, but a significant majority of the scientific community is, is in agreement that it's happening and there are consequences today. So no, no matter what you're concerned about, uh, no, no matter what, what issues get at you uh, and that you're passionate about, uh, in, from our working conditions on the railroad to climate change, Standing Rock, uh, health care, education, could go on and on, uh, war, but any of the various issues I've raised and others that I didn't, uh, they all ultimately point directly or indirectly at the profit system, at capitalism. 
<laughs> so for all these reasons and, and more, now is as good a time as any to step back and review what I, I consider to be some very important history, not only for its intellectual significance alone, but to analyze the relevance of this, relevance of this history, looking for lessons to apply and guide us in our struggles today. And while it is certainly important for the working class to have a day in its honor, in my opinion, that day is May 1st, May Day. Uh, it should be. Once upon a time, May Day was celebrated by the working class in this country as their day uh, to honor those who paid with their lives in the factories, coal mines, railroads, forests, etc., as well as the picket lines. Uh, uh, and, and it was a day to commemorate, to honor, to steel themselves, to organize and prepare for the struggles ahead. As well, it, as well it should be, since May Day as International Workers' Day was born out of the struggle for the eight-hour hour day with the Haymarket Massacre happening not too far from here, being a central component of that story. So, again, in my opinion, uh, Oh, nobody's offended by this, but this official Labor Day coming up this Monday, to me, is an insulting, condescending sham and a fraud, foisted on us by, by the government, enabled by the shameless complicity of, of the labor bureaucracy, a manifestation of, uh, of, of what I'm going to call intellectual thievery, robbing us of our, of our very history. Um, I want to tell a brief personal story that, that I feel ties into this, um, and, you know, transparency, all of that. Um, in 1980, I had been working on the railroad for about six years. I was 24. Um, I considered to be, to uh, keep myself very informed and up to date with what was going on in the world, and uh, stayed up with uh, current, current events watched the news, read the newspapers. Several years prior to that, I was very riveted with all the Watergate drama, hoping to see Tricky Dicky Nixon go down and go to jail, and I was really repulsed by the quid pro quo pardon in exchange for his resignations. In other words, I did what I could to be informed and aware within the limitations of mainstream education and media. Um, in the late 70s, Lech Walesa was leading the Polish working class in, in massive general strikes that were supported by the general population. Uh, and, and, and for the first time, I felt a sense of the potential power uh, of, the, of, of the working class uh, in alliance with the rest of the population when, when, when our demands and, and, and struggles could, uh, could coalesce. And I thought to myself, hot damn, what a great idea. We need something like that here. And at that time, my perception that this was like the first time this had ever happened in, in, in this was like the first general strike in history. That was my perception. Uh, um, uh, and, and again, I, I didn't consider myself to be an ignorant, uninformed person. Yeah, uh, uh, but, but being a victim of, of public education and, and mainstream media, that's, uh, that's where I was at. And uh, I had yet to learn about the 1877 railroad strike, the very industry I was working in, uh, the, 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 the forefathers of the, of the union I was in. And this was actually the first general strike in this country. But I, I knew none of this history. It was, in, in 1980, uh, due to my accumulating anger back then, uh, I was open to some socialists that I met on the job. And this is when I began to learn about labor's history, about Eugene Debs, about, about capitalism, etc. Fast forward to 1984. Um, I had evolved into uh, what I consider to be a respectable socialist, if that's not an oxymoron. But, uh, um, in my opinion anyway, and uh, I was very passionate about the uh, uh, anti-intervention in Central America movement at the time, uh, solidarity with the struggles uh, in El Salvador, with the, with the working class struggles in El Salvador and Guatemala against the dictatorship, solidarity with the Sandinistas and the Nicaraguan Revolution. Um, one of my socialist co-workers went to Cuba for May Day in 1981 and brought me back a lot of pics. And, and, uh, so I knew May Day was a big deal around the world, though I had not yet quite conquered and learned that history behind it. Um, 
So I went on a solidarity tour to celebrate May Day in Nicaragua in 1984. This would be the, the fifth year of their revolution. Uh, and, and which at that point in time still had tremendous potential. It was very inspiring how the working class and peasants uh, had political power and were restructuring their society. Um, uh, and, uh, the gains they were making. How that once promising and inspiring revolution declined and degenerated, that could be the subject of a whole nother forum, and, and, and it is an important discussion in my opinion, but that's, that's for another day. But for this story, we'll just stay at May Day 1984. So before the festivities began, I meet a young Sandinista soldier, he's somewhere between 15 to 18. The U.S.-funded war of, of, of counter-revolutionary terrorists was well in, underway, and the Sandinista army was rightfully on guard for any uh, shenanigans as the soccer stadium filled up. I could speak a little bit of Spanish, but, but uh, we were depend ultimately dependent on a translator. So as I introduce myself as a railroad worker from Chicago, he lights up and in English interjects, Chicago, the Haymarket Massacre. And, and, and then returning to his uh, native tongue, continued to enthusiastically share what he knew of, of that history and its relevance and significance to the universal struggle of the working class. And he was probably very, very proud of himself, thinking of how uh, he, he, he must be impressing me. Uh, but he, he was actually enlightening and, and teaching me uh, uh, as best he could with, with the language barrier. Uh, this monumental history that had played out not more than a few miles from where I actually lived. Um, what does it say about our educational system, the mainstream media, and the established union leadership when at age, age 24 it takes a teenage Sandinista soldier uh, to school me on the Haymarket Massacre? Uh, the, again, the, the, we've just been robbed of our history, and that's why yeah. things like this are, are important. Uh, 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 yeah. to be able to talk and discuss and, and learn from each other, exchange uh, opinions in, in a civilized fraternal manner, of course, um, as the rules stated. Um, so I wanted to, I want to take a minute to, 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 to summarize this. And, and for those of you already familiar with, with this, I, I, I hope you'll find this to be a, um, a, a fresh nonetheless. Um, in the 1880s, momentum was, was growing in the fight for the eight-hour day. And at, at the National Convention of the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, the forerunner of the American Federation of Labor, held in Chicago in 1984, uh, proclaimed that eight hours shall constitute a, a legal day's labor from after May 1st, 1986. The following year, the FOTLU, backed by many Knights of Labor locals, reiterated their proclamation, stating that it would be supported by strikes and demonstrations. Uh, powerful, um, that, it would, that it would be supported by strikes and, and uh, demonstrations. Within the working class, there was debate over demands and tactics, uh, and it's fair to say that anarchists and, and uh, socialists and other radicals in, uh, of the day got a significant hearing in the face of the grotesque abuses of the developing capitalism gone wild. That said, a consensus was developing around the demand for an eight-hour day. It's estimated a quarter million workers in the Chicago area were directly involved in the fight. Um, militant proclamations by some of the anarchists gave the state a pretext for mobilizing the police, and on May 1st, 86, more. 19, 1886, more than 300,000 workers and 13,000 uh, uh, businesses across the country walked off their jobs in the first May Day celebration in history. In Chicago, 40,000 went out on strike, led by, led by some of the anarchists, and more and more wor workers walked off. Eventually, 100,000 were in the street. Violence broke out on May 3rd at the McCormick Reaper um, uh, works. Pinkerton agents, the police, had been harassing locked out steel workers for six months and when workers defended themselves with rocks, uh, the police seized upon the pretext and uh, fired into the crowd, killing two, wounding many. Full of rage, a public meeting was called by some of the anarchists for the following day in Haymarket Square, uh, right around the area of Randolph and Des Plaines. Due to bad weather and short notice, the crowd was estimated at about 3,000 and, and uh, there were families with children. 
Even the mayor of Chicago was in attendance and would later testify that the crowd was calm and that the speaker, August Spees, made no suggestion for immediate use of, of force or violence. Nonetheless, as the speech wound, wound down, with the pretense that a speaker was using inflammatory language, the police marched on the speaker's wagon. As, as they dispersed the already thinning crowd, a bomb was thrown into the police ranks. Uh, nobody knows who threw it. Speculation ranges that it was one of the anarchists who threw the bomb. Uh, other speculation that it was an agent provocateur working for the police. In the moment, the enraged police fired into the crowd. It's estimated seven to eight were killed, dozens wounded. One police officer died from the bomb. Seven later died in the following weeks from gunshot wounds, quite possibly, if not probably, from their own indiscriminate friendly fire. Eight anarchists were convicted of murder, um, uh, though only three were present. Uh, they were in full view at the time of the bombing. Albert Parsons, August Spees, George Engel, and Adolf Fisher were hung, murdered by the state for their political beliefs. They are known around the world as the Haymarket Martyrs. This is why workers all over the world celebrate May 1st as International Workers' Day to commemorate their sacrifice. And uh, that should be our Labor Day. I'll be forever grateful to that young teenage Sandinista soldier who taught and inspired me to learn this history. To get to how May Day degenerated into Labor Day in the U.S. eight years later, uh, Eugene Debs comes into the story. Born in 1855 in Terre Haute, Indiana, he started working at the railroad at age 14. So approximately uh, in 1869. He went from the maintenance shops to working as a locomotive fireman. He became active in the, in the brotherhood of locomotive firing, firemen, rising from delegate from the uh, Terre Haute local to associate editor of the International Union's monthly, monthly uh, paper, the, the Fireman's Magazine. At the time, it's fair to say he bought into the concept of laboring capital, cooperating, working together, but mounting injuries, fatalities, and, and other indignations on the job, he evolved and ultimately became more militant. By 1880, he was the Grand Secretary of the Brotherhood of Railway Firemen and editor of the magazine. In the beginning stage of his union activism, uh, as I said, he bought into that cooperation, and as conditions worsen, worsened, struggles intensified, his thought process evolved. Today there are 13 craft unions in the industry, and back then I don't have the exact number, but it was many, many more uh, before consolidations and mergers. The railroads played the unions off against each other, and, and strikes were defeated by a combination of internal scabs, hired mercenary scabs, unemployed rail, rail workers, um, different unions crossing the picket lines, and also, when necessary, when all else failed, the brute force of the state, aided by yeah. uh, the hired Pinkerton thugs. Debs came to the realization that the unions were so severely weakened by being divided into all these different craft divisions, um, he saw the need for an industry-wide union organization which would unite all the workers on the railroad into one union. He resigned from the BLF, Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, and proceeded to uh, form the American Railway Union with the founding convention in Chicago in, in 1893. And at the time, this was the nation's first industrial union and ultimately became the uh, uh, largest in industrial union at, at, at that time. Because of his reputation, membership grew rapidly. Their first challenge was a strike against the, uh, against the Great Northern Rail Railroad. Within 18 days, most of their demands were met. An unprecedented, decisive victory. Um, within the first 20 days, 34 lodges, locals, had been chartered. Members were joining at a rate of two to 400 per day. Um, and uh, I had it written down, but uh, 
I, I came to find some amazing facts about uh, uh, just how big the American Railway Union had become. Um, it actually had, at, at its peak, had actually uh, was, was more than all of the other railroad brotherhoods combined. Um, I, I had not known that. That was an amazing fact that, uh, uh, that I uncovered in, um, in research, researching this. Um, down on the south side, due to declining profits, I, I, I should also qualify, in this period, it's, it was called the Panic of 1893. Um, uh, mo most of you have probably been through a few upturns, downturns, recessions. Uh, uh, the only reason this last one in, my, in 2009 that they, uh, they called it the Great Recession was because the Great Depression had already been taken. Um, in 1893, uh, they were in a, a, uh, a serious depression that lasted for four years. So, so that's the context, um, uh, background context for this. Um, so as... Uh, so down on the south side, due to declining profits from the sales of, of the luxurious sleeper cars that were manufactured down there um, uh, by, by, the, by George Pullman's factory, uh, surprise, surprise, that market would eventually dry up in hard times, his response was to cut the wages of the workers by 25%, uh, but still maintain the high above market rents in his private company town homes and apartments maintained the inflated prices in his exclusive company town stores. Some families were, were unable to afford coats and shoes. Uh, 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 kids couldn't go to school because they, 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 they uh, didn't have shoes or coats to, 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 to get through a winter to go to school. Uh, they couldn't afford coal to, to heat their homes. When a committee of workers that had been elected by the rank and file at Pullman tried to discuss the situation with Pullman, they were instantly fired. Desperate, they, desperate, they appealed to the American Railway Union for help, um, who was having now in 1894, was having their uh, second annual convention uh, following their founding convention the year before. And there was healthy debate with, within the American Railway Union. Um, uh, Debs advocated for the path of least resistance, trying to negotiate with Pullman. Uh, but, with, but when that door was slammed shut repeatedly, um, all options were closed and, and the Pullman boycott begun. Okay. ARU members were directed to, to, to not switch any Pullman cars onto trains. If any AR, A, ARU member um, was disciplined, then all the ARU members would promptly stop working on that particular line. Uh, this began on uh, June 26th of 1894. All the railroads declared their contracts with Pullman were sacred, so they would not move their trains without his cars. Um, this, so this is what created the gridlock. Not Debs and the ARU, the railroads intransigent that, that, that they were going to move Pullman's cars come, come hell or high water. Um, so this, of course, caused massive gridlock and, 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 and deadlock. And by June 29th, uh, 20 railroads were tied up. About 125 railroad workers had stopped working. Um, and in the context of this deep depression, many unemployed rails were out there and, and the bosses were able to hire as scabs. The leaders of the conventional mainstream unions denounced the ARU. Uh, Deb sent telegraphs across the Great Plains advising his members not to use violence, uh, to not stop any trains forcibly, uh, to just refuse to handle Pullman cars. And of course, fresh in all their memories was the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, which was ultimately crushed with brutal resistance from the state. So they had an idea of what they were up against, and they correctly uh, took, tried to take the high road uh, um, to not give the state a pretext. Um, nonetheless, uh, uh, 
Nonetheless, anti-devs and ARU hysteria was fueled by the bosses using the media, the courts, and the politicians. This hysteria laid the groundwork for a virtual gag order injunction where the leaders of the ARU were forbidden to encourage the boycott in any way. I mean, you've got to think about that for a second. Uh, they were legally forbidden from communicating with their members and coordinating actions. I mean, really, uh, they, they of course defied the injunction on principle. And with the U.S. mail now being being delayed because because these trains handled the U.S. mail, uh, uh, this gave the government the pretext and cover to intervene. The army was used to break the boycott, along with 5,000 special federal deputy marshals, um, many that were actually hired as private thugs by, by the railroad. Um, these temporary jobs were not popular with, with, with uh, men of integrity, and so a lot of petty criminals and other unsavory types were deputized to enforce law and order. And how ironic, how ironic that the federal troops arrived in Chicago on July 4th of that year. The total forces, federal troops, state militia, local police, deputy marshals hired by railroads, came out to, as estimated, about 14,000. Um, the intermittent warfare over several days, it's estimated that 13 were killed and, and 53 wounded. The strike was ultimately busted. American Railway Union leaders were jailed. Members and supporters were, were, were blacklisted from the railroad industry. And around the country, there were, during all of this, there, there were a few pockets of resistance. There were a few skirmishes um, uh, in, in different areas of the country, uh, intermit, I would call intermittent low intensity warfare uh, between troops, strikers, and, and supporters. Most of the Pullman workers were replaced by strike breakers. Deb was, Debs was sentenced to six months in Woodstock jail for uh, violating the injunctions. Um, there had been, there was a lot of support among working people. Uh, elements of labor, there, there was talk about uh, a general strike, but, but ultimately Gompers, the head of the AFL at the time, um, was against it. The, 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 the rail unions, Brotherhood themselves, um, uh, actually, they, they campaigned against Debs and the ARU. They encouraged their members to, to, to scab. Um, 400, let's, Four hundred engineers struck on the Wabash line, and the head of their union, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, denounced them and okayed the hiring of unemployed engineers as scabs. The head of the Brotherhood of Trainmen, who would ultimately merge into what would become the United Transportation Union, inst instructed its members to perform their regular duties. The head of that union stated, the triumph of this railroad strike would be the triumph of anarchy. So, uh, so here we are, over a hundred years later. Um, uh, I'm not sure how well the leadership stood up, and, and I gotta, I, I gotta say this. And as as I was learning some of this, uh, um, at these last two conventions, they start off with the with this big video thing and highlighting strikes, you know, labor history, and they talk about the strike of 1877, and they. They talk about the, the Pullman strike. Uh, in other words, the modern day, uh, the evolution of these treacherous unions back then now try to claim uh, 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 that as part of their legacy when the forefathers of these unions uh, um, actually contributed to its defeat. And um, so, uh, um, I try to be tactful and politically correct when I talk about the labor leadership because we have to work with them. Uh, uh, we have to challenge and, and prod them to do the right thing. They're the ones in control. So uh, uh, 
I, the last thing I want to do is to get into any kind of um, uh, urinating match with them, but uh, sometimes I just uh, 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 sometimes I just have to express my uh, feelings. Um, so in addition to uh, so so as I said, so most of the Pullman workers were replaced by the strike breakers. Debs was sentenced to six months in Woodstock jail. To placate the public outrage over the deaths and injuries of the U.S., the, the U.S. Congress unanimously voted for legislation to make Labor Day a national holiday, and Grover Cleveland signed it into law six days after the end of the Pullman strike. So, in addition to trying to dial back the outrage, Throw a bone to the labor leadership who supported the repression by the railroads and the government. Give them something to show their membership, how it pays to make nice with the bosses. The rulers seize the opportunity to steer the working class from the growing internationalism that was developing uh, uh, in commemorating the Haymarket Martyrs every May 1st. And so that is how we got here. Uh, we're, uh, we're the politicians who try to break our unions 364 days out of the year where uh, I'm sure Governor Rauner, George Walker, or, or whatever, Scott Walker Light wannabe uh, 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 can march in a Labor Day parade somewhere uh, with the leadership of our unions glad handing and kissing babies, uh, put another hot dog on the grill, wave the flag, God bless the USA, and check out our three-day sales on every grocery and consumer item known to mankind. Um, so, I'm anyway, sorry, I had to vent. So, so that's what Labor Day is, uh, but uh, like I said, in my opinion, Labor Day should be May 1st, and, and that'll be part of our challenge to, to, to take that back. Um, so while the government was working overtime to neuter the developing consciousness of the working class, Debs was in Woodstock County Jail. Socialists of, of that era recognized a, a kindred spirit in him and sent him various books, in, including Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. And, um, um, I just want to read, I think this kind of sums it up. Uh, this is from several years later, Debs, Debs would write an article about how I became a socialist, and I just want to read a few paragraphs. It is useless to say that I had yet to learn the workings of the capitalist system, the resources of its masters, and the weakness of its slaves. Indeed, no shadow of a system fell fell athwart my pathway. No thought of ending wage misery marred my plans. I was too deeply absorbed in perfecting wage servitude and making it a thing of beauty and a joy forever. It all seems very strange to me now, taking a backward look, that my vision was so focalized on a single objective point that I utterly failed to see what now appears as clear as, as the noonday sun. So clear that I marvel that any working man, however dull, uncomprehending can resist it. But perhaps it was better so. I was to be baptized in socialism in the roar of conflict, and I thank the gods for reserving to this fitful occasion the, the fiat, let there be light, the light that streams in steady radiance upon the broad way to the socialist republic. The skirmish lines of the ARU were well advanced. A series of small battles was fought and won without the loss of a man. A number of concessions was made by the corporations, rather than risk an encounter. And then came the fight on the Great Northern. Short, sharp, and decisive. The victory was complete. The only railroad strike of magnitude ever won by an organization in America. Next followed the final shot, the Pullman strike. And the American Railway Union again won, clear and complete. The combined corporations were paralyzed and helpless. At this junction, there was delivered from wholly unexpected quarters a swift succession of blows that blinded me for an instant and then opened wide my eyes. And in the gleam of every bayonet and the flash of every rifle, the class struggle was revealed. 
This was my first practical lesson in socialism, though wholly unaware that it was called by that name. An army of detectives, thugs, and murderers was equipped with badge and beer and blood and turned loose. Old hulks of cars were fired. The alarm bells to toiled. The people were terrified. The most startling rumors were set afloat. The press volleyed and thundered, and over all the wires sped the news that Chicago's white throat was in the clutch of a red mob. Injunctions flew thick and fast. Arrests followed, and our office and headquarters, the heart of the strike, was sacked, torn out, and nailed up by the lawful authorities of the federal government. And when in company with my loyal comrades, I found myself in Cook County Jail at Chicago, with the whole press screaming conspiracy, treason, and murder. And by some fateful coincidence, I was given the cell occupied just previous to his execution by the assassin of Mayor Carter Harrison, Sr. Overlooking the spot a few feet distant where the anarchists were hanged a few years before, I had another exceedingly practical and impressive lesson in socialism. Fast forward. Debs would go on to help organize the industrial workers of the world, build the Socialist Party, run for president numerous times uh, between 1900 and 1920. Uh, in 1912, uh, got just under nine, 900,000 votes. And in 1920, uh, as a federal prisoner, in, in he had been sentenced to 10 years in jail under the Espionage Act for speaking out against World War I in 1918, the, the Canton speech. And if you're not familiar with it, um, you can Google it, Google uh, Debs' uh, Canton speech, uh, where he just really spoke the truth about the essence of war, one, one of the most powerful, poignant, eloquent, anti-war um, uh, educational I've ever read. And uh, if everybody in this country could be exposed to that, um, it might be a different. Uh, was it, what's, what's the speech called again? Uh, the uh, Canton. The, yeah. the 1918 Canton, Ohio, okay. um, uh, anti-war speech. So he was sent to ten years in jail for that, along with some of his fellow travelers. From jail, he got almost a million votes for president. So um, uh, even uh, recently, about a year ago. I stumbled onto this. I was uh, preparing for, for a, a, a Labor Day talk out in Woodstock a couple years ago. And um, um, so I was looking to see what Bernie Sanders had said on the record regarding Debs. I, I knew that, that, you know, I, I knew back in his older youth. There's actually a, he actually made a documentary. Uh, and and you, if, if you Google uh, Bernie Sanders uh, documentary on Debs. It, it, it's an audio documentary. Uh, it's really good. I, I, it, it, it's really good. I highly recommend it. But he starts out saying, uh, qualifying that that Debs, uh, Debs, his his ideas are the most uh, what was the most dangerous man in America because of his ideas. Um, that, that's on our Facebook page. Okay, uh, great, great, great. College. It's Bernie Sanders reading. Uh, speaking as uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, along with some background information, it, it, it's, it's really... <clears throat> Fast forward to the present uh, condition facing railroad workers today. Um, what we're struggling and, and, and um, we're trying to, Railroad Workers United, trying to, for the same reasons that devs tried to organize railroad workers into one industrial union, um, we're, we're trying to do that now. Uh, it, it's absolutely essential. Um, as, I t as I said before, running two mile long trains, overworked crews, um, fatigued, uh, threatening engineer only, uh, deferred infrastructure. Um, um, th th these are th th these are just a few, and um, that's why that's why we exist. That's why we try to carry on. Um, what, what Debs tried to do. Um, I want to close, for now, uh, this portion with this quote from Debs. 
One class now owns the tools while another class uses them. One class is small and rich and the other large and poor. One wants more profit and the other more wages. One consists of capitalists and the other of workers. These two classes are at war. Every day of truce is at the expense of labor. There can be no peace and good goodwill between these two essentially antagonistic economic classes. Nor can this class conflict be covered up or smoothed over. So. All right. All right, we'll start our question period. And uh, whoever has a question, please raise your hand. We will record. Do I do I do I call on people? If, the, if Andy's not up there, go ahead and call on whoever okay. you like. I'll just go. Uh, Right. Yes, sir. Uh, does I missed the first uh, few minutes of your talk. Uh, does your union uh, represent any shops, and does your unit at the present time have uh, contracts that it has negotiated for uh, workers? Unfortunately, uh, and, and again, I, I, I uh, spelled this out in the beginning. We're not a union. We're we're a uh, inter we're we're a a uh, interunion intercraft caucus of, of of rail labor activists from different crafts from different unions. Um, so we're trying to we're we're trying to fight for a common agenda within each within each individual respective union. As a way of strengthening them individually, and if, if if we can't if we can't get them into one solid structure, uh, uh, I mean with bureaucracies and and uh, jurisdictional crap, at the very least, if we can if we can motivate to the rank and file to fight, if we can't be in one organization, at least we need to act as one, and and so that that's our kind of more immediate goal. But so no, we we, we don't have contracts. We don't represent any, uh, um, uh, but we're, we're trying to do everything thing we can to build unity within all the different crafts and trades. Why are all these European socialist countries going bankrupt and Russia too? Well, that could be a subject for a whole nother forum. Uh, the short version, uh, uh, I would just say that uh, uh, what is referred to as European socialism is not what I would define. It, it, uh, um, one thing, I, I try to stay away from, the, the terminology can get very confusing when, when the word means one thing to one person and it means another thing to another person. Uh, um, um, I try to emphasize the actual content. Uh, Deb, Debs did a tremendous job of defining what it, what, what it was really, what it's really meant to be. And, and, and he was able to do this before the Red Scare and, and before all of the Cold War and anti-communist propaganda. But the short version, the, the definite, when I say I consider myself a socialist, uh, uh, I, I'm inspired by Debs's, what, what, what he, how, how he articulated, that has nothing to do with what passes for European socialism, for Russian socialism, and again, that could be the subject, should be for another forum, but that's the short version of the answer. Why is Amtrak going bankrupt in the United States? Amtrak, Amtrak. Right, you've got a, just like anything, you're, 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 you're trying to run something that should be a public service, but you're trying to run it for profit, okay? And so, uh, 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 in my personal opinion, mass transit and high-speed rail, uh, just like electricity and, and adequate infrastructure, uh, health care, all of these things, in my opinion, should be human rights, whatever the cost. And, 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 uh, yeah. um, and if you, and, and, well, how can we afford it? Well, how can we pay for it? 
Well, if you take the blood money that, 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 that the oligarchy, the capitalists, the ruling class, the 60 families, however you want to refer to them, they, 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 they've taken that money. Debs would point out that, that they made their money off the crushed bones of children. You know, uh, 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 great, we, we've evolved from, from barbaric child labor, but, but uh, that's where the profits that they have today come from. The, 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 the profits that Rockefeller inherited from generations and generations, some were as traced back to the slave trade, some were as traced back to the brutality of child labor. Uh, uh, so, uh, 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 should society... The answer to your question is, or I'll answer it with a question, should society be run to meet the needs of the masses, or should it be run to meet the profits of the few. And if, if, you, if you think it should be run to, to meet the profits of the few, well, we're doing a hell of a job of it. But if, if you feel it should be run to meet the needs of the masses, uh, that we should have decent public transportation and, and, and not be held to how profitable it is, but is it an essential service and, and put whatever funding necessary, that's my personal opinion. You got a question here. Um. I think that we could uh, probably define those governments in Europe and especially the one in Russia as state capitalism as opposed to the kind of capitalism we used to have which was corporate capitalism which is rapidly turning into state capitalism in this country. But that's a speech. I wanted to know, the last time I heard you speak, we were talking about Lake Megantic. It was over at UE Hall and at that time the conductor of the train was going to be indicted or had been indicted or something. And I know that the trial is over now, but I never found out what the results of the trial was. And I'd like you to give us his name at the same time, if you don't mind. I was actually going to uh, address that in my final in, in my final comment. Oh, That's one okay. of the most important things that that, that uh, Railroad Workers United is is uh, <coughs> uh, um, uh, fighting for. Uh, they are set to go on trial, I believe, in September. Uh, um, uh, there, there have been, you know, various courtroom maneuverings. Uh, um, uh, um, I, I believe September is, is, is when it's actually um, uh, um, be, beginning to, to come up. I'll, um, I'll, I'll double check and get the exact date. So, so that, that, that's coming up soon. And uh, so everything that, that, that I had said before still stands. Uh, they are facing a, uh, you know, potential life imprisonment as scapegoats for uh, for for the reckless uh, policies of the bosses. I wanted to just say one little thing about that, if I could. And that Wait to the rebuttals, please. But, I mean, I, I mean, if you don't mind, unless you have another question. All right, Don, Don Richie. Okay, a lot of questions. All right. All right, this is kind of a two-part question. I mean, first of all, it's a follow-up to what this lady asked about. What I have, you know, I, this, this, look, I'm not, I don't know anything about anything. This Lake Megantic <laughs> stuff is totally mysterious to me. What happened at Lake Megantic? I have absolutely, first of all, understand that I have absolutely no idea. Well, it's funny, I was, I, I was just trying to explain it to my sister on a, a 20 minute ride to drop her off at the airport on my way here. Uh, okay. what, 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 what the woman is referring to is, is last year on the third anniversary I gave a, uh, a Mongo presentation uh, where I uh, um, went into all the sort of details of it. Uh, okay. Um, so that, I, and I, it's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, if, you, if you connect with me, I'll... I'll uh, can you, can you, can the, you the Labor TV... Uh, uh, I, I think Labor TV, somebody put it up there, and uh, okay. well, so I don't know how, so but anyway, the short version, uh, um, you know, the, the short version is this. Uh, there were numerous points of, of uh, eight, nine, ten different points in the chain where things went wrong, and uh, 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 the vast bulk of them fall on the carrier. Okay, uh, single employee crew. Uh, um, uh, um, Something happened. They had a, 
I mean, if you don't know anything, the short version no, is... No, Okay, okay. I don't even know where it is. Explain it's in action. Canada. All right, so what happened... In Quebec. What ha it was there was a, a train fire disaster. Fire the, tr the train is a, a runaway train. train. The, 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 the train <laughs> was, was unoccupied, <laughs> and it was unsecured. It was on a very steep mountain grade hill, and, and because of a combination of circumstances, it, 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 it ran away, it went downhill into the town, took a 10 mile an hour curve at 60 mile an hour. It was about 76 loaded cars of Bakken oil uh, from, from North Dakota and on its way to the, to, to the East Coast. And, and, and it exploded, leveling the downtown section of, of this town, uh, killing 47 people. Wow. And okay. This was in Quebec. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. This was about four years ago. Okay. This okay. was about four years ago. Okay. No and, and and if you want to talk afterwards, I'll give you more of more of a rundown. But okay. the short version is there's a HardingDefense.org. Uh, um, HardingDefense.org uh, gives a lot of the information of, of makes our case uh, ma makes the case of of why. The, these guys are being scapegoated, and that the ones who should be tried are are the are the bosses of the now bankrupt Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic. Okay. So. Okay. In the back there. All right. Yeah. There was a fire on the train, and the fireman didn't know how to apply the brakes yeah. correctly. Well, there's a whole lot, and and I I, well, I didn't want to take up the time unless I'm unless you know right. if, if we have time at the end, maybe I can go into it. Okay. You know what? I don't <coughs> like some. Huh? You know, I don't. About it. What? No, I think about it. <laughs> I said there was a fire on the train, and the firemen went to put it out, but they didn't know how to reapply the brakes correctly, and that's exactly what happened. No. But there's more to it. Shut that up. up. That's, that's your question. Oh, okay. My question is, you know, this guy over here is blurting out that European countries are bankrupt. That well, uh, no, I am tracks bankrupt. But he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. European no, socialist no, no, no. countries do fine. Do you What's your question? Do you realize that European socialist countries are doing fine? Do the, uh, you realize that What's the uh, question? you guys here are paying like 10% tax on your food and your drinks and everything else out here, whereas where all the wealth in America is. What's your question? I'm getting to it. <laughs> Criticizing. No, I'm no, not criticizing. It's the truth. European countries are doing fine. Don't blurt out the bullshit. Anyway, so Portugal. So anyway, oh, okay, Portugal. Okay, so uh, anyway, you realize we're paying 10% taxes here, and these scumbags on Wall Street, when they, where all the wealth is, they pay half a penny tax on all that trading when they, in the casino economy. That's where your wealth is. That's not a question. That's not a question. That was a no, statement. No, I want a response from you somebody that's complaining about what? the wealth in America. A statement yeah, and a search. He's asking what do we do? Why what is the stock market only paying half a penny, half a cent tax? Half a cent. Ask a stock market answer. Ask a stock market answer. All right. Do you have a response? Do you have a, you have a response or not? There's no response. All right, I'll try to briefly, and again, I'm just going to give my personal opinion. Um, when, it, when it comes to taxing Wall Street or whatever, and, and again, this is my personal opinion, but uh, Deb's makes compelling arguments for it, and I've just been won over to his arguments. It's, it's really a question of political power. I have no interest in taxing Wall, Wall Street, okay? What I personally believe, that, that I personally believe, is the working class, we are the vast majority, okay? Uh, we need to find our way to use our numerical majority and our, our economic power because we create the wealth and, and we need to find our way to take political power because we're the majority. That's what democracy is supposed to be about. And I'm all about democracy. I'm all about majority rules, okay? 
and, and I'm, I'm all about civilized, constructive dialogue and debate, and may the best ideas win. And, 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 and if, we, if, 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 we, if we make a mistake and, and, and vote for the wrong ideas, well then at a certain point we'll figure that out and, and come back and, and go back to the drawing board and correct the course. But, it, but, but, but it's ultimately about democracy. And what we have today is... is Concentration of money in Wall Street. And, and political power. And by the way, freight railroads are monopolies. Yeah. But you have a question here? What's the uh, most urgent uh, current struggles you see happening? Uh, are you referring to like on the railroad? Yeah. Uh, repeat the question. Repeat the question. He asked me what 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 uh, uh, what do we feel are the most urgent issues facing rail workers? Um, I'm going to say they can be summed up in the in the safety issues that I, you know, kind of uh, uh, summarized. Uh, probably the biggest battle that we're that we're that we've been digging in for for years is they want to run engineer-only trains, okay? Um, and 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 there's a a group of workers. It's a small railroad called the Wheeling and Lake Erie and maybe about 200 employees and and they have been in a pitch battle for years because they're they're trying to ram an engineer only contract down them uh they're they're economically bleeding them uh they haven't had a contract for seven to eight years and uh, the danger is is that if they try to force them out on strike that that they'll try to bust to, they won't be able to bust a big union. They, they wouldn't try to force the CSX or the UP or, or the BNSF out on strike because they couldn't run. They, they, they couldn't run a railroad that big. Their objective, like they, they, like they did with the Florida East Coast Railway, was to go after a small railroad, run it, bust the unions, and then use that bar and, and, and what they are able to conquer to begin to spread and make that the norm in the industry. Um, on the Sioux Line, I, I, I used to work at CP Rail, before it was CP Rail, it was the Sioux Line, and we were on strike back in eight, 1994 for 47 days. It was the same thing. They're, they're not gonna take on the national rail unions, but, but they'll try to take a small railroad and, and try to run with scabs, with contract labor, and, and this is, I believe this is a very serious issue uh, facing the Wheeling and Lake Erie because if they force them out on strike, they're not going to sit back and, and call the government for a presidential emergency board. They'll try to bust them and they'll try to run that railroad engineer only and then, then you have a, a more dangerous precedent to spread that nationally. Um, so that's a very important issue and then uh, uh, if, if I have time at the end to say a few more things about the trial of, of, of these workers who are being scapegoated with the Lac Magentic tragedy, um, that could have been any of us. Uh, uh, a founding slogan of the labor movement was an injury to one is an injury to all. And, 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 and the, these workers face life imprisonment are being scapegoated for, for, for the criminal policies of the bosses. And uh, we consider that to be a, a very serious issue, along with this engineer who's being tried on with, with a recent Amtrak accident. So it, that's my answer to your question, what we consider to be some of the most serious issues right now. Quebec aside for the moment, um, are you also working to prevent or to do something about the safety problems caused in general by the passage of bomb trains through big cities like Chicago? I mean, Again, we're a caucus of rank and file workers, and and so the, what we do right now is, you know, I, I mean, all we can do is is, is uh, propagandize and try to win over railroad workers that that this is the you know that to stop relying on the existing leadership, you know, look at where we've gotten so far uh, 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 with the existing leadership that we have to take matters, you know, uh, 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 we have to take control of, of our unions and, 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 and then run them. So within that context, 
we do what we can to advocate uh, um, uh, your bomb trains would at least be a lot safer if they were 50 cars instead of a hundred instead of uh, sorry about that that's uh, all uh, right uh, they're, they're running these trains two miles long, okay? Uh, and, and I could go into a whole thing about the difference between a two mile long train and, and, and something that's maybe a quarter mile or a half mile long. Uh, um, uh, uh, having rested train crews running those trains, um, making sure the infrastructure has been properly inspected, both the track, the, the, the rolling stock. There was a there was a bomb train a couple years ago that derailed somewhere out by Galena, uh, out, out there in Galena territory, and, and um, uh, since it wasn't in a metropolitan area, uh, you know, I, I, I think, may, I'm not sure if some of the uh, oil got into the river or not, but, but uh, there was a fire, and, and it turned out that um, I, I think one of, the, one of the cars was defective. Uh, um, uh, and, and again, it, it's all speed up. The, the, the carmen, the, 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 the carmen who inspect the rail cars, uh, they inspect to make sure that everything is rolling freely, that they're proper, properly lubricated, that, uh, uh, the, that, that, that the bearings, uh, the, the mechanics of it, the, the structural integrity in essence. And so when these guys are told, you only have one minute per car, to inspect all the various safety appliances. Um, so, so, so safety is being compromised at every, every possible way that, that, that one is possible. I, I, I can't even recite them all uh, uh, because I'm not a, a carman. Uh, uh, but, uh, 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 so when you ask about the safety of bomb trains, there are so many different factors that would make them much more safer stronger, you know, if you're going to transport these hazardous materials, um, then they should be in, you know, superstructure, uh, um, ironclad containers, uh, run in short trains by properly staffed crews with tracks that have been properly inspected, with, with the rolling structure of the boxcars that have been properly inspected, going at, at slow speeds, you know, and instead of 60 miles an hour, uh, if you're hauling hazardous material, maybe you should limit your speeds to 30 miles an hour. Uh, 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 so, so there's all kinds of things that we advocate for from a safety standpoint, but at this point, that's all we can do is advocate and, and try to gain allies within the workforce itself as well as the community in general to support us. Over here? Yeah, with all these uh, accidents we're having with oil spills with trains, isn't this a perfect argument to create more Pipelines, is that more safer? Well, here's my personal opinion on that. Um, What's a high block? pipeline? Pipeline. Oh. This is my personal opinion. Uh, uh, right now, we can just have an intellectual discussion about pipelines versus freight trains. Okay. But if a meeting like this was like a Congress, and, and people like us were, were the congressmen, were the senators, and we had the experts presenting us the facts, and we could, we, we could then have a meaningful constructive debate and discussion on what is most cost efficient, what is safe, uh, and and uh, what, what is the most safe manner? And and uh, 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 um, so so right now I I don't have so much an opinion on pipelines versus rail transit. Uh, um, I do have a strong opinion on 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 rail safety since that's my expertise. Number one, but number two, uh, to really get. To really have this hazardous stuff. I mean, we're not going back to the Stone Age, okay? So we're yeah, totally. Yeah, we're, we're going to be in an industrial society, okay? So the question is, what has to happen so this stuff is done safely, so that the environment and our safety is not jeopardized, 
and, 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 and ultimately, to me, that gets back to the question of political power, that, that, that we're, the only way we can truly guarantee safe, trans, safe production, safe extraction, production, transportation of hazardous materials is the more political power that we have. Uh, so to me, that's more the discussion and debate uh, rather than pipeline versus rail right now. Last I question. question. Heather? I got a question. Are you familiar with all the studies that are coming in from all over the world now that say at current prices, pipelines or trains transporting fossil fuels, either one of those things is way more expensive than the cheaper solar and wind power that is being implemented all over the world. That is, uh, anybody in your group talking about the fact that we don't need to build more pipelines, we can shut down 80% of the trains as the country switches to cheaper solar and wind, homegrown energy. That's a myth. It's not fossil fuel. What does what your, your group think of that? We strongly, over the last few years, um, and I'm going somewhere with this, uh, um, and it, it, I think it's, it's important to qualify. Um, over the, as I said, we always knew that we needed to, 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 we'll never win anything without the support of the public. Um, how does that happen? How do we do that? We figured it out when they tried to ram this one man engineer only agreement on the Burlington Northern a few years ago. And, 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 and we saw the public support uh, uh, against it. You know, not, not only the workers themselves at the Burlington Northern, their, their, their families, their, 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 their wives, their, their kids, their neighbors. Um, so there was tremendous community opposition. And, and we realized that, that, we, we, realized that, 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 that we needed to, to, to take this out and, and become part of that discussion. And so while we may not agree 100% with every environmental organization and demand, what we do agree is, 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 is again, the, the safe, while it has to be done, it needs to be done safely. And if we're able to trans, transition to a more greener environment, great. And, 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 if, and, 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 and it's important that, that, that uh, just transition, that, that anybody who may be put out of work, whether it's oil workers, whether it's rail workers, uh, uh, um, uh, whether it's coal miners, that, 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 that we make sure that, that they're given employment in the emerging green industry. Um, so, so again, we're, we're citizens of the planet. We, we want, we, you know, we, we, we want a clean, healthy environment just like everybody else. So, uh, 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 so I would say the answer is, is, is we support these kind of initiatives and, and, uh, uh, and just advocate that a just transition be a part of that discussion. Okay, let's give our speaker a one more and question. Sure. How many people want to uh, give a rebuttal? Hold up your hands so I can count. Keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, ten. So, uh, four minutes. That'd be four, four minutes apiece. Okay, who's going to be first? All right. Who's first on the rebuttal line? Come on up. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Given a lot of character. Go, go for it, Frank. Go record. You're on the record, right? Fellow Americans. Yeah, my first suggestion is that, uh, especially the speaker and anybody who talks about. Uh, the application of technology in, in our society is uh, to learn what the DIN norms are. Do you know about it? DIN norms. Not off the top. Deutsch industrial norms. These norms apply to everything that is manufactured. Everything is normalized, is tested in specific ways, and uh, 
uh, in that way we guarantee that, uh, for example, screw or, or a nut or a bolt or a lock works properly because it's uh, tested under the extreme conditions that this, this thing could encounter. So uh, if you go into Europe and you climb into any bus or any train, you see on the outside of the train the DIN norm number and the date that it was last tested. Every train, every bus, everything, you look in the outside and you will see DIN, ta 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 ta. So we are so far behind because we don't accept that uh, there were people who were uh, ahead of us in developing their technological uh, knowledge. Uh, I study engineering, so I, I know very little about much of the world as, as it is. But I have been fortunate to be mostly everywhere in the world. I was in the mountains of Machu Picchu, in the, in the South China Sea, under the sea, uh, in the Galapagos Islands. So I have been nature and I have seen the abuse that humans impose on nature. We dump about 9,000 tons of plastic shit into the sea every day. Every day, day after day after day after day. This is uh, like in, in your house, you start collecting shit, eventually you could move it there. And that's what we're doing with nature. We're killing the, the, the foundation of, of life on the earth. We are a virus. We are a destructive virus, and we don't deserve this planet that we inherited. We probably, we, we definitely don't. Okay. Uh, I, can, I have seen the brutality of human beings I, 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 out in my face. In the Galapagos Islands, the people talk film, but they throw the garbage of all the film that they, all the boxes and the plastic containers in the sea, where the seals and uh, little seals try to play with these things and sometimes they ingest it and they die. Uh, and Albert I saw it with a, with a stomach full of uh, popcorn, this plastic popcorn, you know, dry in the, in the beach. The poor animal consumed these things thinking that it was food and, and it, it, it filled the stomach and, and died. So we are a, a virus, there is no question about that. And I don't think that we can change if we can keep bullshitting each other into improving, you know, technology, improving the way we do, the railroads, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. see. Fuck, we are see. fucking everything. We are destroying the earth. Thank you. All right. Who's next? Hey, up, boy, boy. You fuckers! You old fuckers! I wanted to talk about about how Lake Megantic has been um, has been uh, explained in the uh, in the media. I have a friend who's a very good friend of mine, and I really like him. But he says, well, the uh, brake men didn't set all the brakes. Well, this might be true, because the brake men had been working I don't know how long, and there were something like, uh, I don't know how many sets of brakes to set. And uh, it wasn't customary to go to every, I think it's every other, I don't know, every other car or something like that, and set the brakes. They set enough brakes to stop the train, but they were depending on the brakes in the engine, and the engine caught fire, the brakes did not work in the engine. And so the train was not held back, and it started to roll down the hill. Um, the the um, uh, engineer was resting, and somebody called him and said that, that the engine is on fire. And he said, well, he'd come there if they wanted him to. And then they said he didn't have to. I, you know, I hope that Mr. Burroughs will correct me for all I'm saying wrong. But I, I really think that the uh, mainstream media has placed the blame securely on the workers in the Lake Megantic accident. And it's really pretty obvious that fire in the engine was a very big um, cause of the accident because the engine brakes didn't work and um, that fire had been reported several times 
that there was an oil leak in the engine it had been recording <coughs> over and over and nobody had fixed the oil leak and then it caught fire. So I, I just um, think it's important to notice that the, what's been going out in the media is that the brake man and, and the engineer were the, to blame for this accident. I'd like to make two points. Uh, one point is I think that we need a uh, interesting labor history of the United States. I read a book uh, entitled From the from the folks who gave us the weekend, one of the dullest books I ever read. <laughs> Compare that to People's History of the United States by Howard Sand. Probably half the people here read that book. Much more interesting book. That's one point. The other point is that the, uh, I agree with the, the point that the uh, speaker made toward the end of his talk. Labor unions are part of the community. If you look from a point of view of saying there's three sectors of the community, uh, that uh, Michael Geekin's book, uh, uh, Going Public, he said there's the economic sector, the government sector, and the third sector, the, the community sector. In my opinion, unions should be in the third sector, the community sector. They're part of the community. They should represent the community and listen to the community. They are not with those guys in the economic sector, the guys who run our country, the elite uh, and corporate, e corrupt corporate elite that runs our country. So think of yourself as part of the community. Thank you. All right. All right. I. Um, all right. This is real interesting. I. I had never. You know. I. I don't know if I'm the only person here, but I actually had never heard of the Lake Megantic rail disaster before. I was just I checking it on my cell phone. I never heard of it. That's that's unbelievable. Yeah. Y'all know probably. I don't know how many y'all know who Dr. Laura Chamberlain is. She's been talking about. This. She calls these these trains that have the oil cars. She calls them bomb trains. You know. And, and I thought, this is a lot of disaster, you know, catastrophizing. But, oh, it happened for real up, up there in Quebec. But um, what I really wanted to talk about is, um, well, one thing I wanted to bring up is, is the fact that, you know, I, the end of cap, you know, I really don't think that you're going to, that, that you're going to end labor management conflict by abolishing capitalism. I mean, for, let's take Charlie here. Is, is a government is a, a union activist, and, or you're, you're a union man, and also you, you're a government employee. So you, you don't work for capitalists, Charlie. And, no I mean, way. And, and, right. And, and so, so now, I mean, I'm a union member too, but I actually do work for a, I mean, I work for a corporation, Mariano's, and I'm a member of the um, United Food and Commercial Workers Union. And uh, so, but. I mean, you've got the public school teachers unions. You've got other, you know, other government employee unions. So, you know, as long as there's as long as there's uh, bosses and employees, it doesn't matter if they're government or private. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be a conflict between the, you know, the bosses are going to try to squeeze as much squeeze as much labor out of the employees as they can, get them get them for as little as they can, you know, as they can, and and, and the and uh, uh, now, but there, I don't know how many of y'all know. You know, the speaker mentioned Haymarket. I don't know how many of y'all know, but there's actually a connection between Haymarket and this place, the College of Complexes. Um, now, the, the speaker mentioned Albert Parsons, one of the Haymarket martyrs. Now, how many of y'all here have heard of Lucy Parsons, hey, Albert Parsons? But okay, a few hands go up. Now, Lucy Parsons, after her after her husband hanged, she went on in 1905 to become a founding member of the IWW right here in Chicago. Have any of you heard of the I, the Industrial Workers of the World? Now. A now, a member of the IWW, Slim Brundage, founded the College of Complexes, and um, and actually, so um, so that is the that is the connection between between Haymarket 
and the College of Complexes. So that the, the College of Complexes is in this tradition, not only with, with Haymarket, but all, and Lucy Parsons, the, the Wobblies, but also as, the, as IWW members are known, but also Bug House Square, which was the, kind of like the precursor to the College of Complexes, and the Dill Pickle Club, which is another precursor. And by the way, Slim Brundage was an employee at the Dill Pickle Club before he went on to start his own place in the 1950s. All right, well, that's all I had to say about that. Okay, nice. First of all, the incident in, in Quebec, the gigantic incident, that was all over the news. I heard about it the first time when it first happened. And bomb trains is not some kind of scare talk from Dr. Lara or anybody else. This has been a big issue that's been talked about on the news and among us rail fans, and it's been all over the place. Um, with regard to the comments that were made about the Rockefellers and so on, and um, how they've brought misery to the people, well, I'll simply say this. In 1937, the junior U.S. Senator from Missouri, a future president by the name of Harry Truman, stood up in the Senate. And Senator Truman, as he was at that time, pointed out that, among other things, that the Rockefeller Foundation was founded on the dead bodies of the miners of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. And he went on to point out that the Carnegie Libraries were steeped in the blood of the Homestead steel workers. <laughs> and he went on to say that Wall Street, with its ability to hire the best law brains and so on, had yet to find, had yet to summon up one financial statesman who could see all the, all the dangers in the concentration of, of business. Mr. President, he said, we are building a Tower of Babel. And I think that Senator or President Truman's prediction has come true. And the last thing I will say simply is this, that your talk was interesting and it was inspiring. And it takes me back to my student days 40 years, 50 years ago when I was in high school in the 70s when I was in college. And one of the things we used to say was, right on, right on, all power to the people. Yeah. 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 Oh, the genius. Oh, yes, the, yes, Frank. Yeah. The genius. Yeah. You want to stop oil trains? Yeah. And you want to stop oil cursing your pipelines? And you want a cheap source of power? Thorium. It's thorium molten salt. Oh, yeah. It's so you talking. Clean. You guys listen to this guy. Yeah, right. I just got back, Frank, from the Thorium Energy Alliance oh, Conference. Oh, yeah, I know you. Let him speak. And the thing of the matter is, there's been advances in the field quite a bit. Four you public companies it. in Canada. Right here in the U.S., one called Flybe Energy. 600 people now in China working on it. And for me, the scam of uh, powering the world by wind and solar is, a, is one of the biggest, most stupidest things I've heard. Because the amount of infrastructure it's going to take to make the world all renewable would be a, a, a place of the size of Arizona, full of wind and solar power. Then on top of that, you'd have to have backup gas generator plants to uh, calm those periods when there's nothing around. Plus, you're talking about a smart grid, which would require about $10 billion in order to do, in order to curb things like grid resonance and other things in there. Wow. What you need to understand, right Frank, is that, and you guys too, with these uh, thorium molten salt reactors, that there was a research reactor in the 1960s, they ran at Oak Ridge for about 6,000 hours, yeah. headed by a gentleman by the name of Elvin Weinberg, who, though for reasons not, uh, the reason why we have the plants we do today is basically due to a gentleman by the name of Admiral Rickover and the people he trained in the nuclear field. But now, to get off that part of the things, that there are real solutions. And in a lot of cases, what we're not doing as capitalists is getting the proper role of government in and breaking up monopolistic institutions. 
you know what when you really have competition you you do tend to do things better and then one of the best areas that I see that happening is in the field of consumer electronics you know we've gone from regular TV to 4k H ultra HD TVs in less than a few years by electronics upgrades and a lot of it happens to do with the competition that comes between vendors in this field you don't see yet a monopolistic institution. Now, as far as rail transportation is concerned, there's been a lot that's been going on with you know, between containerized shipping and the revitalization of freight railroading and everything else. But I'll tell you something. For me, that's good for the railroads, but it's a pain in the ass to take public transit. For me, I get into my car at about 8.30 in the morning, and I'm at, and I'm at about 8.10 in the morning, and I'm at work at Franklin Park by 9 o'clock. If I take the train, i got to leave about two hours earlier, park my car at the Elgin Station, and then get off the train. Yeah, that works maybe four blocks away from the station in Franklin Park. Getting home is even worse. When they went freight trains down the same aisle, there's usually a lot of delays involved. Work where you live. No, it's not. But, you know, at the same, I could do that, but that's another story. Um, to make a long story short, we're always going to have this labor management problem. And no matter what company you work with, there will always be somebody dissatisfied. The point of the matter is we're much better off under this globalized capitalistic free trade system than we have ever have in the world. What you may not understand is since 2000, there have been another two to three United States come online with people getting rising wages. We had a financial crisis, but that was all based on what? A liar's loan. The safeguards for capital went out the door, and of course we got what we got. And that's basically what the truth of the matter is. They were just correcting the market for a bunch of, uh, the bills came due and a bunch of liars got ousted, and that's why we had that recession. And we printed 15 trillion for Wall Street. Well, you know, 15 trillion for Wall Street, if you understand something, if we hadn't bailed out Wall Street, it would have been a lot longer and a lot deeper. Boy, well, you know, huh? You are an economist. Yeah. Well, Frank, I'll tell you something else. I probably know more about it than you do. Yes, of course. Of course. Oh, yeah. of course. Now, 10 seconds. Thank you. Hey, that boy, Tim. The American labor movement statistically has probably not been weaker than it is right now since the 1870s and 1880s when labor movements were just forming. In those days, the biggest impediment to the formation of labor movements was intimidation. Pinkertons, we've heard them mentioned a few times. My uncle to his dying day carried the scars of a Pinkerton bullet or two in his shoulder, and he was one of many. It was the price that had to be paid for unionization in this country. Today, we don't have to worry about a Pinkerton clubbing us in the head. For the most part, we don't have to worry about getting shot. What we have to worry about is when the boss calls workers in and says, I hear there's talk about a union. Now look, we've always considered ourselves a family. You know that any time you have a problem, you can come and see me and we will take care of it because we are one big family. It just turns out, however, that some members of the family uh, have a lot more clout than the rest of the family. We are, if we are members of that family, we are the poor relations. Consequently, the need for labor unions is just as great as it's ever been. You know, there are some professions which had been reluctant to organize 
because of course we're professionals. We don't do that kind of thing like have a union. Yet even the teachers, yet even the college professors, yet even the interns at some universities are now organizing. You've got, well you've had sports figures unionized for quite some time and for good reason. I don't know about you, but I look on it as a tripod. One part of the tripod is management. One part of the tripod is government. One part of the tripod is the workers. When any one of those is troubled, there are problems for everyone concerned. It's in the interest of workers in all industries to organize regardless of the fact that they may be told, well, unions are obsolete, we don't need to do that anymore. You'll pardon me for responding to that bullshit. We do need to do it because in order to keep government honest and in order to keep management honest, you need to have workers who give a damn about their situation are willing to do something about it by being members, active members of unions. I happen to have been a longtime member of the Newspaper Guild. I can tell you this, uh, when I left uh, Pioneer Press, owned by the Sun-Times, my situation would have, would have been one hell of a lot worse than it has been if it weren't for the fact that I were part of a union, I were guaranteed severance, all kinds of other things that I would not have had if I were not unionized. I think the same thing is true of anyone here who has lived with a union. I think you'll find that unionization protects the worker, contented, diligent, motivated <laughs> workers do more for the company. Strong companies are things that government delights in. It's good for everyone. Now, you hear a lot of times when you mention unions, you know, you think of, you know, anarchists and other groups like that. The truth of the matter is unions are as American as apple pie. Unions were being formed back in the 1600s and 1700s for various crafts right here in the United States. Uh, they didn't look to some you know, foreign thinker for guidance. They knew that if the bakers of Boston were going to have a living wage, they'd better sit down and organize and decide how much they're going to charge for each cherry pie they turn out. It's as, it's as basic as you can get. There's nothing subversive about it. We needn't look overseas uh, to uh, Marx and Lenin and Che Guevara and others. It's as, it's as American as all of us here. Um, my own politics is basically that of Franklin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, a little of John F. Kennedy, and probably a little of Dorothy Day. Um, it's, it's, again, as American as apple pie. The thing that we have to worry about today, as far as a decent place for labor, is that no, no one's ever going to be throwing tear gas at you, probably. No one's going to be sticking a gun at you, probably. What they're going to try to do is seduce you. They're going to say, and not in the nice way, uh, not in the way we'd all like to be seduced. No, this is something. This is something far more insidious. We're a family. You don't want to go against the interests of the family because you're part of us. You know the old Napoleonic axiom: every private carries in his knapsack the baton of a field marshal. Okay, that may have happened in two or three cases that I can name, that you can probably name, for the majority of those guys who froze on the way to and from Moscow, they never did find their batons. Uh, same thing with workers. 
we're all in this together. We need to unite, we need to be strong, we need to be sensible, and we need to recognize that the guy in the more expensive suit sitting across the table from us does not have to be our enemy. He can, in fact, be a someone that we can work with if it's approached in the right fashion. We need to resort to fanaticism. We do, however, we need to remember that we must keep up our vigilance and no bullshit when we see it. Thank you. All right. All right, I got the okay that's up. All right, uh, uh, let's thank our speaker. He came on short notice for cancellation, so we really appreciate it. Now, last week we heard about uh, Butler's, uh, I guess, uh, uncle or dad who came from Ireland because he was wanted for murder. And tonight we learned about your other uncle who got shot, probably for not paying his gambling debts to the bookie. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Been on the wrong horse, huh? We didn't pay the gambling debts. We collected you, them you, at one point. The bowlers, where do they go? Seems to, seem to be the, the Paynox stones. We don't have any stories like this, you know. <laughs> just, we just go here and, you know. All right, I'll be eclectic as oh, usual no, here. Uh, I was very much involved in the crude oil, crude oil ticker issue. And why did it, how did I get involved in that? Well, I'm a railroad guy along with Mike, and I knew about the incident in Canada. And then there was a second incident, and the third one. And I'm with the Chicago Greens. And I put out a press release that there was something going on here regarding the transportation of crude oil and the explosive nature and the, the series of accidents. And subsequent to, to that, a few more followed. Now, if you really want to learn about it, Don Ritchie, I suggest you pick up this card, and it's got the website of the Chicago Greens. You will find at least 75 articles and press releases, studies, on the transportation of crude oil, that incident in Canada, and so forth. I was working with the consultant in Washington, still are, and we're working with the Federal Railroad Administration on developing 25 safety guidelines, uh, which are currently under review by the uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, Chicago, I was working with the Tribune, uh, at least 70 bomb trains transport through the United States through the city of Chicago uh, on a weekly basis. So we're, at, we're literally at ground zero at this. These things, uh, and it's like Tom and I, we, the last thing we left it, we had a bus trip around the city and we took you to see bomb trains and yards and with your pal there from the railroad work, helped us out on that, he was there. Regarding Amtrak, that guy split out and what Amtrak needs to do is I, I would double the, the number of stations from 500 to about 1,000. I'd make it mandatory that the freight railroads provide uh, a quality passenger service uh, as, a, as, a, as a payment for operation of their monopoly of the tracks and the territory and what they've gotten over the, the, the years of the history of development. At least that I, I'd establish it. Amtrak the way it was, the passenger rail, where it was, I'd say around 1955 or 60. And I'd make the industry responsible for providing quality transportation services like he was talking about. Now the one thing about, that's interesting about a railway union, and that's kind of unique, is trans, it's a transportation union. Now what does that mean? It's, well, okay, so there's different occupations and so forth. No, transportation comes in a unique field. And this is almost like, even though they're pub private sector, it is pretty much public sector as well, quasi. Now you have to think back a hundred years that virtually everything in the United States was transported by rail, and to some extent a large volume of that volume still is. This is vital to the country. They can shut down the country. There's an interest. Anyhow, they're, um, that's where the government involvement comes in. 
um, in this. Now the thing is that they've always run into is that you have the employees, you have the railroads, and you have the government. And guess which two work together? Historically, they always have. The, the government and the, and the industry and the employees over here. One last thing, historically, since this, we're covering some labor history here, one of the most unique railroad strikes in the history of the United States, he talked about it, 1877, began in Martinsburg, West Virginia, outside of D.C., traveled all the way down the rails. I often ride this. It's the route of the Capitol Limited to Washington. And they, they, had, they actually ended up starting trouble. These railroad guys, they actually had a fight here at 18th and Alston. <laughs> a ruckus, but it traveled all the way down the line. And that, that there are on occasion, there are memorials out there at 18th and Halstead. <laughs> What a thousand miles of troublemakers. Come on up. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks to the railroad workers for keeping up the good fight. Yeah. All right. Not a lot of, what are you wearing here, pajamas? Baker gets the last. All right. <laughs> hey, Butler, what are you, is that any one of your... Charlie, you know I stick it to help if I had some interesting relatives. Oh, no. We still got a few trucks, eh? So I don't have a comment on specifically on rail, but in uh, on labor in general. Uh, I like singing, and uh, I like that song uh, by Tennessee Ernie Ford. Um, 16 tons. Mm -hmm. 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older, deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And uh, I apologize if everybody here probably knows the story, but it's because you had mining towns that were company towns that, uh, that basically gave workers credit and then screwed them over by jacking up their rents and jacking up their food prices. Yeah. Uh, in high school, I learned about this, and uh, I just thought, okay, that's great. Well, they pass a lot of stop it. Of course, I'm a naive idiot. <sighs> Two weeks ago, I read in the Chicago Tribune about truckers. They got a little scam going. They hire people, and they say, well, we want you. We'll sign a contract, but you have to own your own truck. But we'll help you get a mortgage for your truck. So they do this, but then they hire too many workers, and they start jerking around the drivers. So anywhere from five years down to three years, these people are struggling and they can't keep up with the mortgages on their truck and they put all their money in their truck and then they lose it. And finally in the paper they're talking about how Congress is thinking about trying to encourage trucking companies to do the right thing. And it just reminded me of the song. Um, another day older and deeper in debt. It, it doesn't really go away. You have the few rich people using all their resources to try to hurt the working class, and um, we just have to stay vigilant because it's not getting better. It's actually getting worse. The rich people are getting smarter. They're consolidating their resources. So, um, so just keep up the good fight. All right. Oh, oh my. Uh, Oh, well. <laughs> good evening, <coughs> good evening, dear friends of Slim Brunswick. Seekers of the truth, one and all, and finders of a new facet of truth, now and then, here and now, in this or that statement or event to improve the quality of life. What do you say? Is I said, good evening, dear friends of Slim Brunswick. Seekers of truth, one and all. Is that does that include you, Charlie? Yeah. Here, Charlie mentioned over here about uh, Butler, that was two weeks ago, not one week ago. He mentioned about his great-grandfather, not his uncle, sir. Well, and also, okay. Charlie, if you look at the bulletin over here, uh, at the, it, it, you got it here, October 28th, 3,448, then 11-11, uh, two weeks later, you got uh, uh, nine, le nine numbers less. And then on November 25th, you got 33, you got 77 numbers higher. Actually, today is the 3,333rd day, three, three, four threes. So which is it? What number? This is important. And now, uh, you mentioned about the, uh, um, uh, uh, Labor Day should be on May 1st. I, at first I thought it was too close to Mother's Day. But mothers go into labor when they give birth to a child. So I think uh, May 1st is pretty good. 
actually in Russia, it's a great, great day. In the church over here, I think you got that piece of St. Joseph, the worker. And, uh, blip, blip. Uh, eight, three, uh, four. About the five. Okay, th next week, we got about, once more, about 9-11. This 9-11 is coming out of our ears. Next week, Saturday, is, is the eve of the, uh, the football season. It would be beautiful to speak about football and how to eliminate concussions. Does anybody want to second that motion? Next week we speak about football and not 9-11, which is coming out of our ears. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll second the motion. Football? Second motion for football? Outlaw football. Yeah. It, it football. might be in 30 years you might it have football be. outlawed. Does anybody have a solution how to eliminate concussions in football? I happen to know a friend of mine. We could talk about it next week. I have a friend of mine who knows about and patented in a system, but he was talking about okay, August 10th is he a wouldn't sell it to the NFL. Of football. And I cooked this one myself. It was St. Lawrence who was uh, uh, roasted on the uh, gridiron. <laughs> and uh, that, that's August 10th. And August 9th is a, is a, a feast day of uh, Edith Stein. She uh, became a nun, and uh, she, actually she's a saint now. And uh, she might become a doctor of church, too. And um, Edith Stein should not be confused with Gertrude Stein, who said, a rose is a rose is a rose. And don't be confused. Uh, uh, and the person who said a piano is a piano, a piano is Gertrude Steinway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the same Lord, when he wrote out a prayer, and he says, on this side, I am well done. You can turn me over because on this side, I am well done. Period. <laughs> Hello, I know. Football's going to be a dying sport. They say moms and Let's try to resurrect it, which eliminate the concussions. Yeah, you can't think they'll ever be able to figure that out. They said moms and uh, insurance companies will decide the fate of football. Uh, you see, you see fewer, the, the big park I used to coach Little League at, you see smaller and smaller fall football leagues with these kids. The kids do not go out for football anymore. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a dying sport. Not even baseball. Only football. Only football. That's where you get a lot of this. Yeah, um, who announced that there's a, 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 a Labor Day event at Pullman on the south side, the Pullman Historic National? Who, did you announce it on Monday? On Labor Day? Where Labor Day started? Huh? Three to six, right? Yeah, there's, so there's a Labor Day, a big Labor Day event uh, at the Pullman neighborhood, which is pretty cool. It's where um, Robert Zemeckis got his ideas for Polar Express and and uh, Forrest Gump, uh, Back to the Future, he lived, he lived nearby, the director. Anyway, but uh, Poland neighborhood's really great to go to if you never had a chance. Charlie and I used to go there for hobo days, <laughs> and hobo stew. Anyway, um, yeah, Wall Street, these suckers, man, paying half a percent interest on their, I mean, we're, we're sitting here tonight paying 10% interest, or uh, uh, taxes, and they're paying a half a percent. You know what, Wall Street wants to make sure they reward companies that get rid of unions. They reward companies that lower wages. They reward companies that go offshore, that globalize, that fire. Whenever you hear the term scale, that's an economic word, meaning economies of scale. And what that means is combinations of companies and monopolies. So don't put this, the crappy medias in this country, when they talk about scale or economies of scale, all they're talking about is monopolies, and that's great for Wall Street scum. So uh, that's all I got to say. Hey, Wall Street. Good. Tax them. Tax your asses. <laughs> No, not that I'm aware of. They did that one. All right. Uh, I was going to ask a short question to the speaker, but I was deprived of it, so that's why I'm here. Okay. Just a question, that's it. That's fine. Uh, he mentioned safety, 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 right? You agree? Are the conductors of the railroads uh, being tested for sleep apnea? That is going on. 
that's going on now. Because it's very interesting because uh, they Use weren't the doing it. Use microphone. They weren't doing it, and uh, there were some cases that they tested, they, they, especially one that occurred where the thing went off the rails at 80 something miles per hour, where he was supposed to be going up for 30 miles an hour. And every, all, they checked the mechanics, everything was okay, and the conductor couldn't tell them what was going on, why was he going. So they te tested him for sleep apnea and he was positive for it. And that explained, and now they're going to be testing also the pilots and um, bus conductors, I guess, too. What, uh, is, it, what are they testing him for? Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, you... Uh, <clears throat> What's that? It's you fall asleep without warning. Well, some of you here are suffering from it and don't even know it. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you. Oh, oh, oh. What's what's the question? Question? He was asking what sleep apnea is. Yeah, what is it? I thought everybody here. What is it? I, I, well, it, it's, it's just a, a condition that uh, some people have. They emphasize this noisy Snoring, but they, you don't have to have it. You, you know. start breathing no. in your but, sleep. But, but you do. See, even the waitress knows. Well, yeah. You stop breathing in your sleep. You don't have to be a doctor to know that. Come on. But the, the thing is that the, the, the patient usually, or the individual, they, they snore. Not to, whether they are fast snorers or not, but they start breathing slower and slower and slower. They finally stop breathing. If, if you look at them while they are sleeping, you can observe this. They stop breathing, and after a while, before they start turning blue, they start, start breathing fast to compensate for the lack of oxygen and buildup of carbon dioxide. And that sometimes wakes them up. So they don't get adequate sleep during the night, and they can fall asleep during the day just like that, without even knowing it. So I think this business of uh, testing the conductors. There's been con railroad engineers for 200 years. Then how I mean, come they're still falling now? asleep? Yeah, let me answer that. <laughs> The treatment for that is CPAP, that, oh, they have complications, uh, cardiac complications, heart, congestive heart failure, okay. or even yeah, heart attacks. But uh, the, the, the therapy, which they call CPAP, is positive, continuous positive pressure. You have to wear a mask and all that all night long. That can keep you awake. And that does not prevent the cardiac consequences. They, there's something recent that they, that's about it. Well, what our previous speaker was talking about uh, is sometimes in the daytime is some sometimes referred to as as micro sleeps, where if you're if you're tired and you know, continuously uh, deprived of enough sleep, you can be driving along in your car and you're you just head nods off your like eye, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, your eyes are open and you just go to sleep yeah. for a second, yeah. and you wake back up hopefully before you run the car off the road and have a crash. Uh, that's recognized uh, by long haul truckers and anybody else that is you know, uh, deprived of sleep uh, for uh, periods of time where they're just chronically deprived and they're on the job for a long time. Uh, what I'd like to add to the discussion that nobody has really talked about is um, the fact that if you're talking about a for-profit system, a for-profit capitalist system, no amount of profits is ever enough. Like if you're making profits uh, off a, a, a mile long train and you have three workers on it, well, if you cut one worker, that may be $60,000 a year or $80,000 a year total that you shave off of that particular run. And that's more profits for the company that owns it. And then you get down to two workers and then you say, well, we've been doing okay, let's shave another worker off of that. And that's a, that's a, a recipe for disaster. And we, and the doctors coined a phrase in 1983 or so about a man named T.K. Jones. They called him um, 
Anybody familiar with T.K. Jones? How many people recognize that name? Anybody? Well, Thomas K. Jones was the Undersecretary for Defense for Nuclear Operations. He was a former Boeing aircraft executive, and for what he was saying in public, the doctors, physicians for social responsibility said, here's a man that is not in an insane asylum somewhere being treated for his delusions. He's in the president's cabin. He's what we call an example of insanity on the hoof, prime beef, as it were. Thomas K. Jones was uh, advocating that there's no problem with nuclear war as long as everybody has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. <laughs> and he was one of the top people in the Republican administration until he was ousted in disgrace. In 1967, the best people in the Department of Energy thought that one reactor accident what we call a Chernobyl today, we would absorb one reactor accident per thousand years of American and service on America. And then, right. Andy, I found out it's untrue. Uh, no, that's not untrue. Don't interrupt me with uh, total bullshit. Yeah. I will call it out. When you say something false, I will call you out on it. Yeah. The best, uh, they thought we, in 1967, they thought by the year 2000, the United States could absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange for cheap electricity. That fact is recorded in a whole bunch of books dating back to 1980, 81, 82, 83. I have those books on my shelf, so don't try to debunk right. that Who fact. Who was the man who said it? Um, it doesn't make any fucking difference. There's, it's disrupting. Uh, there's a book called Adam's Eve. Okay. Adam's Eve has multiple things. Adam's Eve uh, has multiple things. Hold on. Okay. And, uh, Thanks, Andy. So, um, in a for-profit system, as I was saying, no, no amount of profit is ever enough. And we have to start calling out these billionaire predators for what they are as billionaire predators. They're not just uh, rich people running a company. They're beyond rich. They're beyond greedy. They have psychopathic delusions that where a man can say, I only have $22 billion in the bank and I have to put two kids through college. I'm not secure yet. I need another 30 or 40 billion for my family to feel secure. That's where we are today. These billionaire predators are running our country and Exhibit A is Donald Trump and the billionaires that he has been appointing, people with corporate criminal backgrounds, to run our country. That's where we are, and that's what we have to do something about. So I'm going to, one of the chapters in the book I mentioned, Bush and Cheney, how they ruined America and the world, there's a chapter in there that describes how America got to this point where billionaire predators are being allowed to destroy our country. So uh, if anybody wants more information on that, with references from oh, 40 or 50 different books. We'll have a printed list of good references. You can get the books at the library. We'll, we'll be talking about this next week. Thank you. Let's give our speaker a big hand and he gets the last word. Call him out. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, thank you. Call him out. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to finish up in the five minutes. So first off, these are hot off the press. They're uh, Railroad Work United Labor, Rail Workers <coughs> Labor History Calendars uh, for 2018. Uh, some great pictures of, of past struggles, of current struggles, and every day of the month has some... Um, uh, the, the, the calendar was put together, uh, um, I think the woman does uh, calendars for the IWW. I, I'm not sure, but I, I think that's the person that we contracted this out. So if anybody might be interested, it'd be a great Christmas gift, uh, get, get a jump on it early, uh, see me. Um, there's so much to cover, uh, uh, but what, 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 what you just said though, I, I, absolutely, this is why, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, there, 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 there's not going to be an accommodation, um, it, it, it's never enough. Um, the one gentleman talked about that we're destroying the earth. Um, yeah, that, that, there's there's something to that, uh, 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 and then I, you know, to me the question is simply, do we give up? I mean, if, if we give up, then what are we even doing here? Or do we do do we fight to save it? Um, uh, so I'm I'm I believe in the fight to save it, um, uh, as far as that goes. Um, 
the, uh, the gentleman who dismissed uh, European ideas. Uh, um, I, I totally respect what, what you had to say uh, uh, um, and, and the, uh, the, the legacy and, and, uh, for, for, from your family and the, the, the scars. And, and I would just say it, 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 it's really important that we find the common ground, conquer as much common ground as we can, uh, agree to disagree on some issues, fight together on the common ground that we do, that we can conquer and, and, and that which we agree to disagree on, just resolve that we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out down the road. Um, uh, I, just in defense, uh, yeah, some of these ideas may have, may, may have come from uh, Marx and Europe, but, but the, the beauty of Debs is he Americanized them. He, he put them into the context for, for, the, for the U.S. working class. And you could read Debs and never even know that Karl Marx existed, uh, and, and he makes sense in, in how he motivates for, for, for that, that we need a society that, that's essentially run where the vast majority uh, 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 run it democratically uh, in the interests of the vast majority. And then uh, uh, I talked about different Sol, you know, uh, I, I can't even remember the uh, salt th thorium uh, molten salt reactor. Um, I don't know. I don't pretend. I can't claim to be an expert on that. I do know that there's there, there's quite a bit of. Uh, I, I have read about that that there is quite a bit of ecological destruction in the um, with with the wind farms and everything like that. I, you know uh, uh, that that that's not exactly pure and green. Uh, um, to that, I would just say that. In a society run democratically by the vast majority of the working class, we would have science at our disposal. And, and the scientists would be working not for the corporations, but for us. And then, and, 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 and if, as you propose, that uh, thorium molten salt reactors is the most e e ecologically, environmentally friendly, cost effective way to go, I'd be all for it. You know, so, but, but, but to me, the challenge is. Getting science uh, uh, in, in the hands of the working class, that will, will enable us to figure out how, where we need to go with this. Um, uh, se several uh, speakers talked about, you know, the, um, uh, you know, current labor and uh, uh, the, the, the guy in the back with qu quoting the country song and, and uh, uh, one of the articles I came up with, it, when I'm quoting or borrowing from somebody, I give them credit, but, uh, but th this is one of my own. And, and the, the, the labor officials today, um, there, there's a tendency, I call it, uh, to, to, to uh, um, uh, go to the slave masters and ask them to stop whipping us so hard. You know, maybe not so hard, Maybe a few less lashes. That that's what our labor officialdom does today. Yeah. And and what I feel needs to be done is we need to organize ourselves to take the whip out of their hands once and for all. Okay. If anybody wants to talk about Lachman Jet, that's a whole separate discussion. And uh, Harding Defense. Dot org. Uh, there, there's some good facts on that. And, Give us your um, website. What's that? Give us the website again for it's, you. I, I, it's, our website is railroadworkersunited.org, and and then to, uh, to 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 get a good analysis, the truth of what happened with Lock Magentic and and uh, um, Harding. That's what the name of the what, one of the engineer who's on trial, uh, Tom Harding. It's called Harding Defense. Dot org. Uh, so I would suggest go to that website. So, okay, thank you very, very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We're adjourned and we're a little bit late. Back. Could you all please kind of move to the back of the room in order to be fashioned? How many of your relatives are still in the room? Don't forget, next week we can.